Christmas, Christmas greetings yet, Jerry. What we're doing in this demo, and I don't know if we'll get this all done tonight or not. Uh, we're off to a late start as it is here, but there's three components here. First is the disc, which I have on the lathe right now. And that disc, I have these beads on here for a reason. And that is in the plane of the outside rim, but it's dished between the bead and the end where the post is here. So when I put the paper towel, I'm going to get it off of here, on there, it's going to ride on the, on the, the beads here rather than the whole paper towel rubbing on the bottom. And uh, so that we have to drill this hole. This one here, we can, we, we will drill it white when it's on the lathe here. And that I just use my uh, portable drill to bore that one out on that. All right, if we have time, we're gonna keep going. And this is the post and the post can be decorated. This can be very simple. Um, this actually could be square and you could move the post, the tear off post, I call it, over in the corner. It gives you more room between the uh, center post and that post there. So a mega roll doesn't need quite as much space as you normally would if you stayed in a circle like this. But we also need to turn the edge down here. We're gonna talk about that quickly in a minute on that one. Um, and I don't really do anything to the back side. I'll just sand this off a little bit on the back. This is actually a uh, tabletop from probably the 30s or 40s. It's a nice old piece of oak. I have five leaves of this that Tom and I picked up in um, Oak Lawn from a lady who contacted the Hickory Hills Woodworkers and said she had a bunch of her husband's uh, wood, most of it scavenger pine. So we took the good parts and left the rest. And this could be nothing but a post or you can make it uh, work on the top. This could be a plain dowel or you can try to decorate it with different types of features on there. Any questions? I tried selling these. I've made probably 50 of these things oh. over the years. When I, back when I was a younger guy, I tried to sell them, but I couldn't compete with Walmart for 15 bucks probably. And it functioned just as well as this. It wasn't as pretty, but that, uh, that's what happens with the Walmart areas, I guess, on that one. So we'll get started on this, I think, and talk a little bit about tools and spindle turning. Okay, we have to make this round. And you could use a bowl gouge, a 40-40 grind on it would be probably the best way. Or you can use uh, a spindle gouge. The biggest thing here is, this, oh, by the way, this is this double face tape. And right, right here, yeah. I was in a flea market, Ray and I have been talking about flea market. I, got I, my I still got part of a roll of those yeah. too. We bought them at the same time. Yeah. The, the guy was selling this for five bucks, five dollars a roll. And this is probably at least a $30 roll of tape. At least it is double sided, clear. And boy, it sticks. Tape and it does stick. You could use carpet tape, but I recommend getting a good grade of carpet tape. Uh -huh. uh, not, not something really cheap one, you know, the thinner they are, you know, the worse it's gonna be. But this is actually just taped down here. What I did was get my disc centered up fairly well. And then I put the tape on the, on the uh, face, face plate. plate. And then I brought up the tail stock and you can see where the point is right in the middle. It also centered it for me and used it as a press. Either your lathe is, can do all kinds of other things. We're gonna use it as a drill. Right. Bead post in and press it in with that and get a good straight post in the center rather than relying on other means on that. So all those things will work. When we turn this, we're going to use a, a spindle gouge for this one. And it's important that you understand, if I put the spindle gouge over here, and hold that up like that, I'm going to start chipping the wood off 
as it comes around the long grain going this way, and as it hits into that wood, it's going to start pulling out pieces of the oak, and that's not a good thing. I want to go toward the headstock. So even though the tool rest is pointing in this direction, I'm going to move toward the tool, uh, toward the headstock. I'm going to keep the tool fairly high. I want to rub just behind the point and uh, on that end of it. What I do not want to do is go off the other end. If I go off the other end, I start pulling wood off this side of the board. So that's not a good thing because it's, it's difficult to fix all that too. So um, I am on the high side to understand what you're turning, what you're comfortable with. You're going to see me turn it at a faster um, speed when I get on the center post or the other the tear off post and well, there's much marks on the wood. So here, I'm running fairly slow there. I'm going to turn this over this way, maybe. I don't know, can you see that, Ray? Yep. All right. I'm going to approach the board, and all I want to do is keep my handle high, and I'm just letting the tool make a lead on the wood. Once I, oh, boy, is this dusty, dry, old oak. Now I have a ledge here. I'm just going to move across the board. I'm using the point and a little bit of the lower wing to cut. And I'm down to about a, uh, oh, three sixteenths of an inch from the bottom. I probably could have gone a little bit farther. And I'm coming back the other way and cutting that side. Now, if you want to see whether you're bumpy or not, hold the tool up there. It sounds like it's still a little bumpy. So we're going to have to do that again. And you could be shaping at the same time if you wanted more of a roll to it, uh, depending on how much wood you want to take out of there. Ooh. Probably running about 17, 1600, somewhere in there. Faster than a normal bowl, faster than the low, the low side can go. There I'm just nibbling off, I'm using the point of the tool. I'm not cutting too thick. I came back the other way. I have a little bit of a slant now. So I can start turning this a little over this way. And bring that around a little. Now, you could take that same spindle gouge and do some shear cutting with it by dropping the handle, even though we're coming around there. Same as a bowl. Drop it. Bring it around. You're going to save a lot of sanding doing shear cutting. Believe it or not, you can shear cut on spindles also. And you can see what's coming off of there now. I'm going to bring this around a little bit and I'm going to bring the surface is not quite, not quite flat, but pretty close. So I'm doing a scrape cut here. Just flattening that out. The big thing here is I want to make sure this area is <coughs> perpendicular to the headstock. And that way when I put my tear off uh, mortise in there, it will be uh, square and not be tilted. There's a shear cut. Just bring it around the corner. I move my tool rest there. There's not a whole lot. I have to be moving with it. Swing your hips to the left, come back to the right, swing your hips around to the left. Now I have a nice little quarter round on that. 
Okay. So I don't worry too much about this area right here because I'm going to cut most of this out of here anyway. But I need to drill a hole in here. So I'm going to uh, turn my speed down and I'm reaching for my Fossner bit. This one is a three quarter inch Fossner bit. Um, there's two ways of drilling holes. This one, of course, is going to go into tailstock, but there's another tool that uh, was introduced to many years ago. And that one is nothing but a piece of three eighths inch or you know, three eighths inch uh, high speed steel. It's ground on a little bit of an angle here and it's ground on a bevel here. So there's two cutting edges here, this one and this one. I would start with my spindle gouge. We're just gonna make a little bit of a hole here. I wanna get uh, the gouge has to go a little bit lower, but then when we put that up, it's very important to be at the center line. So we can start putting a little dimple in here like that. And I don't wanna get any bigger than three quarters or I'm gonna look bad. But we can also take this now and raise it up a little. And I want that right at the center. Okay, go in the right direction. Because it's cross grain, it uh, have a little trouble in there with it. You'd have to go back to your gouge, take a little more out of there. But what really works well is going straight down and then across the bottom. So if you only have a half inch drill, you could actually drill this out and then you're going to match your mortise to the, on the uh, spindle to fit that hole. So it's much easier, of course, if you have these are, uh, this is a Freud carbide uh, Bosner bit. I've had these probably 20 years at least. I've never sharpened them and they still cut very well. I haven't hit any nails with it. That's what you don't want to do with carbide or any other one as far as a Bosner bit. I'm going to leave the tailstock loose. And what it's doing is finding center. Once it's found the center, I clamp it down. And now I can drill in. I know my piece of wood here is uh, about an inch thick. So if I go to the top here, uh, I'm in there almost a half an inch. So I go a little bit farther and probably down to about there. And I have a hole drilled. And I'm done with that. And it's about a good three quarters of an inch almost in there now. At least 11 sixteenths probably be about right. Okay. So I would normally sand this. And when I get it all done here, I'd normally sand it. We'll do a little bit of sanding, but not. I'm not going to bore you with sanding all that out. But what we're going to do now is turn some beads. Um, a face plate. Oh boy. This is a little bit different than turning beads on a spindle because we're dealing with the grain, long grain, cross grain, long grain, cross grain, long grain, cross grain. So it becomes a little more of a problem there. I want to, I want to, uh, I'm going to face off this area right here because I want to have enough room for the, uh, Post to sit on that wood, and I want it nice and perpendicular again. And this is nothing but a scrape. That's about all I need in there. So I'm going to start with a bead out here, do about five of them in a row, and in a row. And what I'm doing is I will start with the point. I'm going to have the point pierce into the wood. And then as it starts to go deeper, I'm going to start dropping the handle, pull it out, 
roll over the top of the surface of the wood and into the next bead. And then just make another one and then roll it out, take another one, roll it out, and take another one. And then I'll come back and just refine them a little bit. The trick here we'd like to do is to make it progressively either small to large or large to small. One or the other, they look better than all the same size because then you'll know that it was probably done with a D-way pointed down like that. <laughs> that was pointed at right. All right, so I need the handle up high, right at center. And I'm just gonna touch the wood. I push toward the head stop. My tool rest might be just a hair too low. Okay. Now I can pull it out, rotate it. And I'm gonna go big to small. Push it, lift the handle back up. Let it cut into the wood. Pull it back out, rotate it up, pull it back out, just like that. Now, I noticed that this one and this one are look very similar, mm -hmm. so we're going to do a little bit of cosmetic problem here. I also want to roll the inside one a little bit more. And I got the handle down, and I'm lightly touching the wood. I'm going to cut it a little deeper, pull that out. This one I'm going to try to keep the same, same size. This is what cross grain can do to you. Just come back and touch that up a little more. I got to pick up my speed a little more, I think. There we go. Now I'm going to make this one a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to make the third one. Like that. Now, from that point on, out to here, I'm going to dish out this disc. And I'm going to switch my spindle gouges. This one is pretty steep. It's probably boy, 70 degrees, somewhere in there. I use this for undercutting the uh, rim on a bowl, things like that. But right now, I want to take some of this wood out of here. Just a pull cut. And as I come out here, and I... I Hold it back out. I can switch up a little bit here and get this cut down a little farther. We have to handle in tight, and I have it at, at uh, parallel to the waves on the on the height. Even. And all I'm doing is rubbing the bevel here. And I got it turned over at three o'clock. So now I just cut in. I can see there's a little bit of a ridge there. I'm going to raise that up gently. Just take that out of there. Now it's all clean on the bead and down. Now I come back to my other gouge. Light cut, light cut. There's a little bit of yeah, enough. like that. That's sandable. We'll just come back into that bead again, like that. And we have that pretty well done. There's a little bit of a bump out here. I guess I didn't quite finish all the way across. Like that. What I really have to be careful of there is, yep. Um, yeah, there it is. I want that post 
to be all in between those two parameters there. So I'll even make sure I leave enough distance there to, to take care of that and it will sit, the shoulder will sit it totally on there. Now I'm going to take a little more out of here. There we go. Okay, any questions on that? All looking good. And again, it, it just does not have to be gone to that extreme. This is a bargain box from Klingspore sandpaper. And you can buy 20 pounds for 30 bucks, something like that, I think. Somewhere yeah. in that category, depending. You can buy less, I think, too. I think they have a five pound box of it also. But uh, the only thing you can designate is if you want fine and medium, or do you want medium and coarse? But uh, you get a whole bunch of sandpaper. It's all different kinds. This one is flexible. And some of these are belt pieces. And stiff. And stiff. <laughs> and some of them are finished material, like this one here. is uh, fills up pretty quick. Um, it's really stiff and it also, sanding wise, it, it'll fill up fairly fast on you. So I have here is I have a um, uh, hundred, a <coughs> hundred through 280, I think it on here. And you get a pretty good assortment of them. If I get them back in the same order, I'll be okay. And all I have to do now is make sure my speed is sandable speed. If I turn up too fast, all I do is burn my fingers and and part of the wood is just doesn't sand there as well. So I'm gonna make sure I slow it down a little bit. And even though it's a, uh, a cross grain wood here, it'll stand out pretty clean. Just remember when you're turning that this is taped down here. Um, just make sure you have two good flat surfaces. And this is the three three phase motor on here. So I can hit the button, turn it in reverse, and Pick down to my 120 is in the pile here. 120. You notice I didn't stand the B. I will. I didn't want to use 80 on there. I hope they are not that bad. But they are. You stand paper, what you got to use to use it. So always stand up to the edge. Don't try to go over the top of that thing. Let's just clean it up that way. I'm going to flip back to forward because it's a lot easier to sand the beads when they're moving away from it down. And I don't know if you can see it all, but I'll stand the same direction. Light back, I hope. Okay, so on the back side, You got them coming towards you, but it uh, makes the sanding a little bit easier that way, too. So between the two of them, you can round those off. Come out here, stand a little bit there. And then you go a little bit on this side where you can see it a little bit better. And I'm not going to go through all these grits, so it's good enough for what we're doing. On there. Okay. Now... I have to drill another hole, and I'm going to drill that with a portable drill. This one's a half inch brad point on there, and all I'm going to do is eyeball this. Uh, you got your light in the in the other camera. Oh. There you go. Sorry, yeah, that's what my TV would have helped me. 
Now I can lock it up this way or on a robust here, I have another one with an index pin that's a little bit, little bit uh, not quite as bouncy. No, that's a way of saying it. So I can turn this one in and now my hole, it's, it's not gonna move at all. Actually, I think I wanna go up a 90 degrees here and make it a lot easier. You'll see it better too. That just screws in. And we take this and I'm looking now is to see, I can see the ways underneath and I wanna center that up on the post here or on the disc. Looking pretty good that way. And I'm gonna hold this part as steady as I can. Or you could clamp it down and hold it on that way. Okay, so for demos, this is good enough. We got to get rid of this one. Uh, watch how much it takes to pull this thing off. Okay, so our disc is pretty well done, at least for that part of it. And we can set that aside on that. And this, back to your station there. Need my cameraman on his place. I <laughs> keep falling over. <laughs> if you have a drive center, it's a good idea to take it to a grinder and cut a notch in it. That way you'll always know where to put that back in. And it will center it back up for you. And I need my delta. I'm going to hear a little noise out of that Delta Free uh, Live Center. It's uh, older than some of the people watching this video. I won't mention who they are. <laughs> it's not Ray. <laughs> I'm older than it. <laughs> older than dirt. <laughs> On there. Okay, I'm going to turn this down. Check it out. I have to see if I can rebuild the bearings on that one to dry. I got Old one age. just like it on my dad's. Old age. <laughs> like the rest of us, huh? Yep. That was my dad's. I want to move my tool rest a little bit below center, and I'm going to use a roughing gouge and take this down to. Uh, uh, we need to talk a little bit about that. This one right here will work. Okay. I made these, the two, uh, the two that I have here tonight, I made these for a mega roll. You want to know what size paper towels you're going to use or you're going to make it for the biggest one you can. The, uh, the distance from here to here will dictate it. I, uh, you can turn the post a little bit smaller. This one will take about any any paper towel roll on it. But if you look at the post, it's uh, about an inch and an eighth, somewhere in there on that. So the distance between the two is uh, if you're hurting for space, you can uh, make it a little smaller and then use a square for the base and put the post in the corner. You don't have to have a post. Really, not, a, not totally necessary, but you just want to know the distance here. Um, this one from center to center is probably three and a half inches. To give you an idea, sixteen blitz each, and it may inch and a quarter on there. This is a drilled out three quarter inch hole, and it's my go. Um, go no go gauge when I would be doing this and then I could just take this off measure to make sure I have that tenon the right size. Just drill it out with the same bit you just drilled in the uh, disc and that will give you a way of just taking the back end off here and 
sticking this on here. You could do it with the plate, but it's a little more cumbersome. Okay, first thing we have to do is take this down. And we're going to use a roughing gouge. I have an inch and a quarter, but I use a lot for this kind of work. I would use a, a, a one inch. You'll notice the bevel's quite steep here. This is probably 25 degrees, somewhere in there. I prefer that because I like to drop the handle and cut on an angle rather than coming straight into the wood and ripping off the uh, oak especially. I'd rather take it this way and chip and take it off on the end. And you're gonna notice, I'm gonna work from this end back. And I wanna you know, work backwards. I don't wanna go into the wood this way. I will pop off the corners and tear out the wood and cause more too many problems. So we're gonna go a little faster now. I wanna make sure my tailstock is in and I've got it locked up. Now I'm gonna throw some stuff in gray. Most of it round. The, uh, the thickness here now, the thicker this post is, the one thing you really have to make sure is that that post is no bigger than this hole. Everybody understand why, right? <laughs> now, how do we explain that to you? <laughs> It ain't going on the pool roast. He's asleep, <laughs> did he? <laughs> the other thing is, this does not have to be perfect. 
It really is going to be covered up by a paper towel for 99.8% of the time it's in existence. So I'm just going to use the tool rest as my point. I'm going to take a look at how far I want to go down here. What I'm doing is judging how much shoulder I have, knowing how much shoulder I have on my on here. And I have plenty, so if I bring it up in here somewhere about here, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference there. Now I can go either direction. And then you notice with the speed I just moved, it's getting smaller. You're at about 3,000? No, actually, probably 2,500, 2,600. Okay, we can look it up over on that little cheat sheet. They move along pretty well. The noise from that uh, priest live center. Again, I'm not going in like that. I'm going on an angle. And you can see the difference. When I push harder and move faster, I'm going to get the ripples, especially going there. All right? What did I just do? See that wood there? Okay. I went against the grain of the tear wood and then came back on this side and to tore it up some. But uh, I can, you know, when I'll go on the other side, slow down a little bit. almost like a skew. The roughing guys is about as close to a skew as a lot of tools can get. And we're we'll turn it this way on this side. So still I didn't have balance the water. As it gets thinner and you push it, you get some vibration. This is still the diameter I want, so close to it. You'll notice that, that how long do I want this post? And if we just hold that one up there, I guess we can go this way with it. Is I would like to have the paper towel holder somewhere in this area right here where it doesn't show that much of the, the spindle on there. The other one's a little bit tall, but uh, this one's about the right height. So I pull that out. I can use it and get some idea. I highly recommend these pencils. Uh, Ticonderoga elementary ed pencils. My wife was a kindergarten teacher and showed me this pencil. I put it in my shop and I wouldn't change it for anything. It's uh, fairly soft lead, it's dark. It really showed up very well. I use it on the inside of bowls considerably. Is that a good way to say it? It's a Ticonderoga number two, and it's a, called a primary pencil. Wait a minute. Oh. My first, my first Ticonderoga is what it is. You probably could Google it. You could buy a box of them at a time if you want, or sell them off <laughs> to your friends. Uh, the sandpaper again is it's. Uh, you know, if you don't get it quite right, I recommend some 60 grit. 
and just use that 60 grit on here. Again, don't go too fast with your sandpaper or you'll be bouncing. But you want a moderate speed and do not wrap it around your fingers. to do when you get done with a grit is go with it. And sand that back down. Like that. And you go through all the different uh, grits, go down. Usually for this kind of work, uh, 220 is all you really need. Um, the oak, I stain all these. I don't, I don't uh, leave them natural. You could uh, dye them with red and fill the grain after with colored wax or whatever you like to do. Make it a little different, make it a kitchen look rather than the formal part of it all. Uh, well, next, we're gonna have to turn the, turn the end down here. And you could make that pretty simple. Um, there's all kinds of options. Again, it, it seek your your skill level. I will show you some beads and some uh, a ball probably on the top of this thing. But um, as I said, I've made a lot of these. And I used to do a lot of spindle turning in my younger days. The uh, upstairs someday I should post a picture of a my four poster walnut bed. It's all turned and it uh, came out pretty well. <laughs> myself the back, right? Okay, the tool rest, excuse me, the tool is important here. And I want to have that where at my three o'clock, nine o'clock, or three o'clock is about at center. So I center, I can, center. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be like this and hit in the center. I want to have that pretty well. I could be a little bit below it. But um, I want to be able to finish my beads and things that way. And this is the height of the thing, so I want to come back. I want to make my first cut somewhere in here. I'm going to turn it over to about 11.30 and just rub the bevel. As I rub the bevel, I'm going to turn this down and talk about this. As I rub the bevel there, I'm going to pull it back a little bit and rotate the tool as I raise the handle and then come to the left a little bit to get off of the bevel too much on that. So the motion is from here, bring it back a little bit and rotate, but everything is into my body. I do not want to be out here trying to waggle this thing around. I want to have my point. I want to get three points. The anchor here, the anchor on my my uh, hand, and the tool against my muscles over there. Everybody laughing? No. <laughs> Serious bunch, I tell you. Okay. So, demo. Rotate. And lift the handle. Rotate the handle. Come to the left. And there we just cut a half a bead on that. And that's what we want probably on the bottom of the post. So now I have that one. And then I'm going to do the opposite. When I go the other way, I'm going to start with the bevel, raise the handle, and rotate my hips toward Ray and bring the handle up at the same time to come around and go the other. Usually this one's a little more difficult because you're not seeing the cutting edge quite as well. So hand down, feather rubbing, take a little bit off. Do it again. Third time, take a little off. What can go wrong? <laughs> yeah. What can go wrong? If you get on the wrong side of the point, 
If I catch the left side of the point, it's going to cut back. It's going to skate. Oh, it's going to skate up here and just ruin this whole side here. So it's important that I am keeping the cutting edge to the lower side of the point and raising the handle as I do that and rotate to make that cut around the corner. Rub the devil. Find the cutting edge. Okay. Don't be in a hurry. I bring it over to three o'clock. And right down to the bottom. Like that. Uh, I used to have some burning wire up here somewhere. If you notice this on my lathe, this is wire I use to uh, wrap around a piece of wood and, and I can burn these in if you want and decorate a little bit more wherever it went. Oh, here we go. I knew it was right here somewhere. This is copper uh, braided house wire. And we're gonna smoke it up here a little bit. Notice the two handles, the dowel, a little super glue. Uh, then over the copper, put it in there, wrap it around a little. Do not wrap your fingers around any of this. Give a little push. The wire's getting hot. Woo! And we put a nice burn mark right here. Just a decoration. Now we're going to finish this bead. Put the other half in here. And we're going to do back the same thing we did here. We're going to do over there. I want to rub, and I don't want to go, and I want to take it all at once. So maybe I should come over this way a little and cut some out of the way, cut some out of the way, cut some more out of the way, and I'm cutting on the left hand side of the point, just like that. Any questions on the bead? So I wanted to put in a, a, uh, I don't know how things get lost. Where's my, my doll? Here we go. I can make about all, anything in here, but there's my, my uh, bead here. Now I'm going to put in a, probably a longer cove because it wouldn't look good to have this cove, half bead, half bead cove, uh, right up against this one here, unless you made it quite a bit smaller anyway, but you're probably going to do some of that. I'm going to take some of this wood out of here anyway. That'll make a decision. I'm going to cut through the bead. Just up to the edge. Now I'm going to do a half, a half feed into that bottom of that B. I don't know if Ray would be better moving over and watching on this side. And now we're going to go to a cold. All I did was start on the, on the uh, half feet top of the half feed and rotated my tool over to about 11.30 as I went down the pole. Now I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Whoop, I think I'm going to do the same. And I can cut it that way and cut it that way. Maybe a little more room here. Remember when you're cutting coal, sandpaper in the coal sands very well. You lose them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can make it, you 
take that way. So I need to take some more of this wood out. And depending on what you want to do here, you can do uh, a barrel. You can stir it off. This switch to a half inch. It's kind of a barrel look on the top. You could cut uh, little grooves in here and burn them. Anything like that. You could burn them right now. You could burn this other side of the beef. I remember when Kyle became a member. Well, Okay, that's, yeah. <laughs> it's true. that's what happened. <laughs> Piano wire is the best. Or guitar wire. If I had Alex, I could pull a little guitar wire off it. On that one. Well, we got enough dark in there. Anyway, when Kyle was... Um, you have a piece of there. wire stuck in there? Huh? You have a piece of wire stuck in there? In there right now. No? Okay. Uh, it's just wood fibers here. Yeah, like uh, anyway, when he first came in, he, he, he bought a set from Craft Supply or somebody of three of those with the ball. They're still in the shop and uh, different thickness of the wire. If you know somebody at piano, piano wire works well. Uh, guitar wire, if it's metal, can work pretty well. All those things are good. Actually, you can use Formica. It doesn't work quite as well, though. Move there. Okay. There you go. Uh, lengthen this out a little bit more. That's a little deeper. Like that. I'm gonna put a little half half pole right here in the loop. All I do is roll over, put the point into the wood. Now I can come back here and do a half feed into the bottom of that half feed. Come back. Make another one. A little deeper. I'm going to clean that up quite a bit. Now I'm going to go back and start turning the other side of the ball. A little that way. A little that way. What I did again is a half feet. Come back on this side, move back a little toward the center. Again. Just come back again. I'm starting to get a rudimentary look at a ball. I'll come back on this side now. Raise the handle. Finish up at 3 o'clock with the handle straight up. Come back over on this side. Take a little too much wood off the top here. And all you really have to do is get close and you can sand the rest of it. Here's that shear cut on the spindle we're talking about. Don't push into the wood. Just kiss the wood. Go back on the other side. Now I could have put this in the stuff. Put that 
about to talk to me. I could have put this into a chuck and let this in, actually left this square and to cut it off uh, would be a little bit easier on there. I noticed I got a chip right here. So I'm gonna change this profile. I don't know if you can see that in that other camera. Yeah, I can, we can see it. There's a chip right out here. Uh, so we're just gonna take that down. Just change the appearance a little bit. Good enough. Got rid of the chip, most of it. Sand some of that out on that. So this piece is uh, pretty much done the way we want it. And uh, we could sand these down a little bit, uh, but in order to time, we could might be able to get this whole thing in one night. What time are we going out here? 8.30, okay. Um, I would have cut this off. And all I'm doing is cutting down this area here, cutting it down. You're gonna see when I get within a quarter inch or so, I will slow the lathe down. And um, I might actually reach for my skew, which is straight up there. <laughs> Step over the tripod. <laughs> and uh, it's a bit of a trick for them. So right to, to your right, to your right more. Right there, that one. Yeah. That one, there we go. This is a skew that I use for cutoffs and things. This is actually a planer blade. If you find planer blades, uh, grab them because they make wonderful uh, skews. You could use it for a light scraper, things like that, but the steel is outstanding. Very good, hard, high speed steel, able to take a uh, an edge well on um, Okay, so three eighths inch, if I can get it in. Uh, smaller spaces there. On um, that, this one's a little more pointed. You get down on that corner I want. So it's important that you move the waste wood first, so then you can come back and use the other one. And you can see a little bit of wobble. I'll turn my legs down a little bit, loosen that up, and rotate that off. And the bearings don't make so much noise either. Now it's running more true again, because I had pressure was trying to bend the wood a little bit on it. Um, there, I can take a little more off of here now. Again, waste wood. To the waste wood. To the waste wood. To the waste wood we go. Now I'm down to a little less than a quarter of an inch. I'm going to do the same exact thing with the long point of this tool. I cut into the waste wood. Raise the handle. Cut into the waste wood. And it's starting to wobble again. Last cut. Shut it off, Paul. And crank that back out. Boom. Notice I, I stayed in the waste a little bit, and I have a hump on here. That's because it can tear out between centers. If I would have been on a, uh, a chuck, then I probably could cut this off and it would be pretty clean. I wouldn't have to sand very much, but I do have to sand that, that uh, chip out right there, get that rounded off. But you get an idea of a ball and a bead or a cove and a bead. And again, it's, uh, it, they're all making it gradually smaller to under the ball and then the ball appears on the top and it looks like it belongs on the top of something. So proportions are important here. The bead could have been a little bit smaller than this area here. And then this top of this cove would be a little bit smaller 
which it is, uh, on that one and then finished down. I could have made a half bead more here, or I could have brought it right into the bottom of the ball and had the ball basically standing on a pedestal without any indentation of the ball into the top of that cove on there. So that's what that part looks like. And this is uh, very similar. But, uh, I already pre-marked this. Again, I know which one is going to go into that uh, wing. I get it in the hole. There we go. That's all lined up. And way. Never put things piled up on your leg. For some reason, I don't know. Imagine falls in. Ray and I were talking the other day about things we've lost in the sawdust. And I was telling about a nine inch tool rest that I had lost. And I was you know, remembering all that. And Ray says, you know, you sold me that tool rest. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> oh, that's a want it back? <laughs> and I says, no, I think I remember now. I couldn't find it, so I bought a new one. And then I had two. And I said, well, I'll sell it to Ray. <laughs> and he got a good deal on that. <laughs> oh, the pit's getting old. It's getting old stuff. Okay, <laughs> now, this is one inch by one inch. That's not a whole lot of, of uh, circumference there. And so again, it's how fast you want to go with it. If you want to make sure my heel stock is up and tight, I want to look at where my edge of my tool is going to be at center. And I'm going to again work off the corner. I could do a peel cut. I keep raising the handle. Now I know how much I can go. That was because I had it too high and I cut with the edge of it. Breaking it off. Drop your hand a little bit more. Make a smooth gauge and I'm going to set my calipers on that lock that son of a gun it says half inch <laughs> oh <laughs> on there we got a ways to go a half inch will actually be very close to the uh, tip on this thing so you get some idea of an indicator enough wood to have a lid and that goes in the socket. So that's about all I need right there. Again, by the time you get this cut with all the design on it you want, as 
doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be all smooth here. And you notice I started down at this end with, with trying to take off as much wood here as I can. If I were to start up here, this becomes thinner, becomes weaker. So now when I get down here, I'm going to get even more vibration than I would if I cut down this one first. We used to do a lot of very thin spindles. Uh, we, had, we had basically contests in the old Chicago wood turners. And we would be down to diameters of a boy, an eighth of an inch. Uh, Bill Atchison has showed a couple of those on his, his uh, mm -hmm. flowers and things like that. And Bill used to be quite active in that too. And so uh, we always started at this the tailstock in and worked your way down, put your features in as you went toward the headstock. When you got down here, life was a lot easier than it was down here. The only problem you have when you're making those same things is if you start up the lathe and you got pressure on it, you're liable to twist it right in two. So you had to be careful when you did that. If you didn't have everything too tight. Pretty good right there for the start. And again, how much we need, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. We're pretty close right there anyway. But I have to get a half inch here on the tip of this thing. And that, uh, that can be tricky. Um, I'm going to use a parting tool on this end and just uh, cut down enough of it that I get, and I think might be about a half inch. Again, I said the tip of this thing, yeah, they were not quite to a half inch. So the, uh, the bevel on my uh, live center here, The better you get at this part of it, the uh, tighter that joint will be, and the less you have to move your work. But again, you're cutting full circumference. It doesn't take much, and all of a sudden you're too small. Oh, that's my problem here. But uh, I don't have enough out here in it. Wanting to eject this thing. So here's my go no go gauge. Yeah, it's got a ways to go here yet. Hopefully, we can get down there. I might have to get Brother Ray a little tater. Uh, start at the right hand side of the magnet and the fourth one, two, four, the fifth one, the fifth one right there. Yeah, we'll talk about that one. <laughs> uh, again, flea market material. This is a reciprocating hacksaw blade. And uh, it was this wide. And the teeth were down on one side. And they put it in there and it saws back and forth on a piece of wood. I bought it for a dollar and I've made two of these. So I think I'm way ahead of the game on that one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not cutting anyway. <laughs> That's good. He's better. Not even close. Uh, it's taking much more off here.
One more cut. Mm -hmm. I think we're closer. Closer on the hill here. Back to the, uh, I think it's about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Uh, grinder in the background still slowing down. <coughs> That's going to go for at least two minutes, even though it's shut off. There you heard the capacitor kick out. Yeah. Right about where you want to be. Inside up. I think we're good. We'll pound the rest of that. On that, okay. So all this is again is uh, guessing. You could take one of the other spindles like this. And this is what I call my dog bone series. It's just <laughs> half beads and cut and then whatever on the top of it. But you could lay it out like this. You can, you know, this is probably about the center. So you know you got half of it there. And now this will be the other half here. And another one here, and then whatever you want on the top. Um, this time, I think we'll go a little bit farther and just put a ball on the top on that one. You know, save a little time. Mark them again. Three pencils. And I'm going to switch over to my with the long drive on it and put in my uh, beads. I'm going to put a half bead here. Again, bevel, left hand side, roll. And yeah, that's about all I did right there. All I did was rotate the tool over and keep it on the left hand side. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to cut one from the left and one from the right. Going that way. And again, this one's a little more difficult. Going that way. That's my dog bone theory. And I had to take the center out and go over to my <laughs> This is Sears, probably from 1960s. High speed steel. They're not real long, but if you ever see these and you, you can buy six or eight of them for $35, buy them. Um, I was lucky enough to pick up a set of six, I think, for 30 up at uh, Windy City. And uh, it's, it's good steel. It's really nice for doing pens. Uh, very nice for kind of spindle work like this. And uh, we're going to use this to take out some of the long poles.
cutting to the side I'm going to a little bit past the center line. Over here. Working toward the center on this hill, stop, and on this hill, stop. Just take it out. Go back. Go back. And then keep like that. Another one. Always to the side that's going downhill. If I stick the other side in there, it's going to tear it up the back up. It'll climb the hill. Light cut. Speed is helping me here. Like that. Okay, up here we're going to make a little bit of difference. Cut in a little, we'll take this a little smaller. Take a little more wood out of here. Go back and cut this half bone here a little. Uh oh, oh, we're going to cut a little more than a half bone. <laughs> A little bit of design change there. Yeah. Get it back to what it was. Maybe we can come back. Okay, let's slow down a little bit. Clean that up. Okay, FB right about here. A little smaller, a little smaller. Move the back and go down here. Again, if you get close sandpaper, it can help you out considerably. Now we can put a ball on the top. Cut that part down carefully without catching that wind again. Come on this side. Get a little waist whip. Go back. Go back. Go back again. A little more off the top. Then another cut to the right. Slow, slow, gently, gently. No pressure whatsoever now. They really let up on it when I come around and make that delicate cut. I'm going this way now. I have to stay on the lower side though. If I don't, it's going to jump back. Very good. Because of the catch, that half feet is quite big. I don't want to do that Not like that. Drying that down a little. This is a hundred grit paper, so and you can see what's happening here. Go up. up. Same idea to cut it off. Gonna use a three eighth inch gouge. Take the waste wood out. Cut 
clean up that egg, roll the top of this ball. And the ball doesn't have to be perfect. One thing we want to talk about is it's better to have a squatty bowl ball than a very long looking like a, an egg. It's, it's, if it's taller than it is wide in circumference, it's not going to look good. If it's shorter in height than it is in width, it's, it's going to be fine. So that's where you want to make the difference. Take a just a smidgen off the top, but we're not gonna do the bottom. We're not gonna do that right now, I know that. Yeah, so it's a little bit high, but it's uh, just a matter of picking up some more wood. We'll get another piece somewhere. Um yeah. This one here. Like that. And this one's a little high too, the way it sounds. So it's, yeah. Remember that part that we left the tenon? I would take it over to bandsaw and saw that off, and we'd have it like that. But that's pretty much the idea. Um, stop stain it, however, you want to finish them out on that. Okay. We did it one night. 